My name is Bob, and today I'm going to be presenting SwiftUI Delegate Pattern. I work at NodeLocker as a senior Swift developer doing encryption. But today we're not going to talk about encryption. I'm just going to talk about SwiftUI. So I just say thank you for coming around and welcome. So what is the agenda is working with legacy, uh, with legacy code, uh, making the best of best use of Swift uh, UI kit in within Swift UI world. We're going to also talk about understanding what is Swift UI coordinator. I don't know if any of you have any of you heard of a Swift UI coordinator. Oh, okay, a few, a few hands. That's nice. How to communicate your changes from one as, uh, views to other parts of Swift UI, and then putting it all together. And then we'll have a Q and A section. Ouch. So before we go, I think I just want to share this, uh, you know, river. This is you, an iOS developer developing Swift UI code. It's pretty awesome, no? Yeah, it's, as you can see, you have a requirement is iOS 16. Fine, I think you can write Swift UI code right now, and you can even sit on your coach, use iPad to write Swift UI. How many of you do, do that? I think a lot of you people do that. Yeah, I like it. It's nice. <laughs> this is you. <laughs> <laughs> now the reality comes, you know, into play. What is, right is Swift UI code? And then they you, you need to support iOS 13. Would you take this requirement for your product owner? What would you do in the first place? No, I don't support iOS 13 or something like that. I mean, I deviate. Anyway, back to the problem we want to uh, solve. We are, we are talking about working with legacy code. So some people might argue that UI kit is really legacy at this point in time. Should we re-implement everything in Swift UI? How many of you agree that we should re-implement everything in Swift UI? I mean, if you agree, just raise your hand. Oh, one person. Okay, interesting. Does Swift UI really have all the components that we need? By my right hand side, you can see I have a view. This is this is as you can see it. Uh, it's a web view, right? And uh, what is it doing? It's collecting a two-factor authentication. That's just it. I, I want to collect two-factor authentication from the user. And I want to enter my password and show this, you know, nice, strong password, weak password or something like that. But this is a web view. And as an iOS developer, wow, I don't want a web view in my life. <laughs> I want something really native. So with this web view here, I really want to give the user, I want to track um, the state of the user, where the user has been. I don't want the user to start all over again when entering, you know, uh, two-factor authentication or doing password, you know, this is a, an onboarding flow. I don't want the user to restart because you can stop the implementation, uh, the registration at a certain point in time and then just kill the app. But I want to, you know, pick the user up from the same point of, you know, where he stopped. With the web view, it's literally impossible. Then I had to implement it in. So this, yeah, this is the view I wanted to show, I wanted to show you guys. Um, it's about the, how we would implement this same view in a native format. As you can see, it's pretty clean, straightforward, and it's all Swift UI, like totally, uh, uh, neat. But at the same point in time, we need to collect this two-factor authentication from the user when the user inputs it. Doing this in Swift, uh, in Swift UI alone wasn't like really possible because the QS started finding a lot of bugs when the two-factor authentication come on top of the screen. Swift UI freezes. They couldn't, you know, what is happening? You input it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Then come the job of the coordinator. I had to re-implement the whole uh, screen, but at this point in time, I had to use UI kit to implement this, marry it together with Swift UI. So understanding the Swift UI coordinators, what is a coordinator? A coordinator is just an instance in, within the Swift UI components that helps you communicate changes from one place to another. It is an associated type uh, when de it declared as void, it works as a delegate, and it's also available for iOS the thing. Putting it all together, how do we match the coordinator uh, with a legacy code base using UI kit? 
And what is the main purpose of doing this? The main purpose of doing this is actually to enhance and resolve all the bugs that were present in SwiftUI. As you can see from the diagram above, we are trying to use a UI test field to receive the input from the user and then communicate it back to SwiftUI when the user finishes inputting the two-factor authentication. Now, the declaration of UI representative is pretty straightforward. As you can see, we have a bindable property and we have our make UI view contest test field that just returns a UI test field to you. And then later, I'll be, I'll be communicating to you what the bindable pro uh, string is used for. Let's go forward. This is our whole business logic. Here we are checking uh, the maximum length of string that's supposed to be inputted into the UI test field. And when the test string is up to the count that we require, we can return true. And the, we make the coordinator here. It's just a type of self. As you can see, it's the nested type. To the parent right now, when you finish editing the test field, we say, we call the parent dot bindable and we assign the test field that was, you know, uh, that is the correct one. Using this in Swift UI is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have, you know, the initialization of the two factor text field and it also requires the bindable property right now that we're going to bind it to, to the Swift UI view. In this case, we call it two factor code. But wait, there is more. You're not finished yet. It's important to remember our old friend, which is the delegate. Without assigning the coordinator of con uh, the contest of coordinator to the test field delegate, nothing happens. This is where the whole thing lightens up, and you can see our further business logic inside there. And this is the delegate pattern in Swift UI. You can reuse legacy old co uh, old, old code base from UIKit to enrich your SwiftUI implementation. You don't have to re-implement everything in SwiftUI. Pretty nice. <laughs> Thank you, Ar. <laughs> so, okay, my name is Yavva, and no surprise there, I work at Nord Security. More specifically, I work with the NordVPN iOS application. And today I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, screenshot automation. Why am I talking about this, right? Uh, why would you need this? Uh, so basically, you probably need screenshots if you ever publish your app in the App Store, right? Or maybe you're trying to do like some App Store optimization campaign. And if you just have like a little app with some simple features, if it, you don't have to navigate through a lot to get to those features and take a screenshot, then it's completely fine to like sit down for five minutes and just do it. However, if it gets like a little more, more complex. Uh, and if you have, let's say, a need for localized screenshots, uh, it eventually can get to a point where every release, there is a person who has to sit down, go through all the features, switch the language, do that all over again. And we have, we're supporting 10 languages at the moment. So you can imagine that can be a bit of a torture. And there's no need for that nowadays because we can really automate anything, right? So today I'm going to be talking about automating the screenshots using Fastly and Snap Snapshot. Um, I'm going to go through just like a basic quick start setup. Uh, we're going to look into like what different parameters we might want to use to make our screenshots prettier. Uh, those are like quite universal to use. And then at the ending, we'll look if we can make it run a bit faster. So starting with Fastly and Snapshot. I kind of assume that most of you have already heard about Fastlane. But for those who haven't yet, it's like a Ruby-based tool set for automating various parts of your development cycle. We already use it for various parts of our development, like testing and distributing and stuff, automating those parts. Uh, but we have not previously have done it for screenshot automation. And Fastlane has like this one specific action dedicated for that. It's the snapshot action. And we're just going to look through all the good things that Fastlane advertises in their documentation that why this is the solution for screenshot automation. So the first one is the localization support. As I mentioned, since uh, for us, the much of that labor is switching between languages. This was the main point why we were interested in this solution. Uh, because you pretty much just 
pass an array of languages that you need, then it will run it on all of those languages. Uh, the other part is you can get any screen size that you need because, well, it runs on simulators. Uh, so again, you can specify whichever ones you need and then you will get those. Uh, the other good part is, so when you're running on a, a lot of simulators, uh, you don't want to keep waiting, like the more simulators you use, the longer it might take. So it also supports concurrency, which is nice and takes less time. Uh, and of course, since Fastlane has more than one uh, action and function, uh, you can use Deliver to deliver it, all of your screenshots straight to the App Store, which is also nice because you're skipping some steps. Uh, then the solution itself is based on UI tests, which means that at the same time that you're taking the snapshots, you can also implement like UI verification. Whether you should combine testing the UI itself and producing screenshots this is a different like topic. I personally would say maybe not, but there is an opportunity in that. Um, then of course, uh, since you're making screenshots for them to look pretty, you want to have options and having like different kinds of appearances, so light and dark. And the same goes for the status bar. Uh, so what you don't want is probably have an automation set up in the middle of the night and have it produced like with the saying 2 a.m. And then the user thinking, oh, those poor interns, why are they making them do it all at night? So what you might want to do is to have, you know how Apple in their keynotes have like iPad and iOS screenshots with like 941? So yeah, so that's what it does. And now I'm just going to go through the quick start for a very basic uh, initial application. As you see, this is just like the initial Hello World app that you get if you create an iOS project. So we're just going to take a home screen screenshot of it and see how we need to set up Fastlane Snapshot. Again, since it's based on UI tests, uh, the first thing you need is you're creating your UI test target. You have to set up a scheme for it. Uh, of course, like, don't forget this, <laughs> since you're working probably with more people than yourself, you want to commit it. And don't forget to check the run. Uh, then uh, you want to initialize the snapshot. So uh, the, the prerequisite for this is, of course, installing and set it, setting up Fastlane itself. Uh, but it's not too difficult. You just can use a proof for that. Uh, one uh, file that is quite important uh, when setting up Fastlane, and most of you that use it are familiar with, it is FastFile. But along with that, when initializing Snapshot, you're going to get uh, these two new files. So the first one is Snapshot Helper .swift. Uh, it contains like a lot of helper implementation that uh, we need to use it when setting up UI tests uh, to set up launch arguments before launch, uh, to run the app with the correct locale and language, as well as uh, it has like implementation for taking the screenshot itself and uh, saving the file. So we do have to include it into our UI test target. Uh, the second one is the snap file. Sounds very familiar to fast file because it's a configuration file as well, but only for the snapshot action. So in the quick start, I'm just gonna seeing how it's gonna run without like many uh, parameters. So we're not gonna touch the snap file in the step. Uh, so then as you're creating the UI test target, you got your UI test class initialized. Uh, one thing you always have to do when running uh, UI tests, you have to launch the app. Uh, and for snapshot, you have to call the setup snapshot action before launching the app because, again, it's using launch arguments and those will be applied only if you call it before launch. Uh, then the other step, was, which is very UI test based, uh, so you have to describe how do you want, how do you get to the state in the app so you can take the screenshot. Uh, for those that have not encountered UI testing yet, uh, Xcode has this really nice record button. Uh, so when you run your app, you can press the record button and it will generate the UI test for you. However, I would advise being careful with that because as with all generated code, it tends to be messy and not be managed nicely. So if you do generate it, just please clean it up <laughs> for maintenance reasons, you know. Uh, but in this case, since I'm just uh, taking a picture of the home screen, I'm just waiting for the like uh, image or the label to load. And that's when I want to take my screenshot. So I call the snapshot function. I pass the string to it. The string is how I want to call the screenshot. Uh, so when the screenshot is going to be taken, the image name is generated like this. It, it first says, let's say I read this on iPhone 14. 
it's going to say iPhone 14, the home screen dot PNG. And then you just call Fastlane Snapshot. Now that's my project name there. And if you take a look at the duration, you probably might see a reason why I'm not doing a live demo and I wouldn't with this. Um, so yeah, this was the initial run for the this basic like home screen uh, screenshot. Uh, apparently, Snapshot initially ran it on all of the simulators that it found. So yeah, it was nine simulators. It ran on one language, just on English at the beginning. And it took like 18 minutes, so that makes it like two minutes per screenshot. Uh, also, yeah, I guess the black sheep here is uh, the little simulator without its appearance being like reset. So, but we might be able to fix that, right? Okay, so now let's see that now that we tried the basic setup, let's see how we can like specify it. Let's say I want to change the devices that I'm running on, and maybe we want to see how the localization works, right? Um, and also see that pretty status bar. Uh, so that's when we need the snap file. So the snap file is the file where you want to put all of your parameters that you're reusing for your snapshot execution. Uh, so in this case, of course, I'm specifying that now I'm running on these three simulators. If you added simulators manually and renamed them funny names, just be careful because they will not be found. Um, so just check the naming. Uh, then I localize it to German and also pass uh, the German language. And I'm passing override status bar to true. But of course, you can put in snap file any, again, reused arguments that you want to use for snap file, uh, for snapshot command. These two are the screenshots from iPhone SE that I got from the previous job. And we already see one good thing. So we have Hello Welt on one side and we have Hello World on the other. So that's good. That was expected. What isn't expected is this other part, right? Like, what is this? <laughs> uh, so first we got the empty bars, then we got 1236, 1230. Or and Prespiet, which is a Lithuanian word, because when I was running this, I was on Lithuanian locale. So funny thing is that when when I was implementing screenshots uh, with Fastlane Snapshot initially, like not for this presentation, the overhanging status bar part actually worked out of the box. Uh, apparently, that was likely because I was using Xcode 14 and I was running on iOS 16. And apparently, since Xcode 14.1, uh, they kind of changed the way. When you create your test target, uh, they add this nice optimization thing where they execute in parallel. How does it look like? So imagine you have many tests, right? You selected them to run, let's say, on this iPhone SE. You boot up the simulator, and then you're going to see uh, like copies of that simulator being instantiated, and then the test being run like in parallel on those copies. The problem is that the default Xcode like uh, status bar override command that is being used by uh, Fastlane Snapshot uh, only overrides the original simulator status bar, so it doesn't get applied on when they run on copies. So in that case, if we want to use this uh, Fastlane parameter at the moment, uh, we would have to sacrifice this execution in parallel. So again, this kind of uh, goes into the why are you do you want to have ui tests validating your ui or do you want ha to have nice screenshots since for this the purpose is to have a nice screenshot i'm just gonna unmark it and see how it goes and af after unmarking it again since overriding uh, the status bar seems to well, the last version that it worked on was ios 16 i have to specify the version in this case and let's see if it worked it did. <laughs> uh, so it's 9.41 a.m. So that's nice. So the localization is still there. Again, I just uh, only put the two screenshots so I can zoom in the status bar. But then, okay, so and at the first run, you saw like all lights appearance. Then one was with the dark appearance. Pr then it was like both dark appearance screenshots, now light appearance. It's probably irking somebody, right? <laughs> if there are any pedantic people here. So what we want to do, we want to have a choice, like uh, whether we want to use a dark screenshot or a light screenshot, right? So let's generate both. So the uh, parameter for dark, like for appearance, is basically just dark mode, which is a Boolean. Uh, so it's either false or true. So And so far, we put in our parameters in the snap file, which applies it to all of the runs of snapshot, which in case we want both light and dark, doesn't work. 
So what do we do? So people who worked previously with Fastly likely already know. <laughs> we define a new lane in the fast pile. So likely uh, if you've uh, initialized Fastly in, in your project, you already have a fast file generated. Uh, you're already going to have the uh, default platform iOS defined for you. Uh, since you initialized the snapshot, you'll also have this lane generated for, to the, for you. But likely in the fast file, you'll only have this uh, capture screenshots uh, function called and with a scheme passed. But we can move the scheme in the snap file since the scheme is not going to change. And in this case, yeah, we just call the capture screenshots uh, function two times. We call it with dark mode false and dark mode true. But one thing we have to remember is specify the output directory. Now you remember how the image name is constructed with the simulator and the name? So imagine it if you run it two times, what's going to happen? It's going to get overridden. So that's why you have to specify two separate output directories. Okay, seems to have worked. That's kind of nice. Um, but now while you'll be running Fastly and Snapshot, uh, if you take a look at the console like outputs, you're going to see that apparently it's actually building and linking and compiling everything like for each device, which doesn't sound really optimal, right? Uh, so we, what, can, what we can also do is implementing building only once. For this, we're also going to use uh, some uh, configuration in the snap file and uh, in the lane and fast file. So in the snap file, what we need to add is this test without building. But in order for this parameter to work, what we also need is a derived data path. And now that we're calling capture screenshots two times, we can add the path here. And before that, we have to call uh, an action to actually build our project, like our target. Uh, so we specify the scheme the derived data path, select to build only for testing. Uh, and yeah, we execute the scan before and then do the capture actions. However, when we're talking about this building only once, uh, have in mind that when I ran this for my little simple app with just like one label and one image, there was no like improvement in time. Why that is, is because the app itself is like really small. There's like nothing to build. Uh, so. It really depends on your application. If it takes a longer time to build, it will eventually pay off to have uh, the building extracted. But if it's quite small, if, if it's happening really fast, it might be that it doesn't even pay off that uh, execu like executing it concurrently uh, is actually more optimal for you. So what you would have to do in this case is just test. And of course, since I mentioned that there were a couple of issues like with the status bar and stuff, uh, there were also more specific issues that we faced, uh, specifically when talking about our app. So one of those is like uh, some of our features are, are not really accessible on a simulator. We would need an actual real device. Another is like, how do we uh, fill it with pretty data? Like, how do we make sure that it's not just like an empty test user screen that we open up? And then, like, how do you reach really complex features? Because even if you implement reaching them with UI tests, it can take a long time. Maybe you're making actual, like, network calls and it's, like, loading for a long time. And what we found is that mock, using mock states works for us. So in this case, I'm not going to talk about, like, <laughs> specifically that you need to use one or the other architecture. What you do need to have in your architectures probably is, like, uh, this... Uh, module that's responsible for data and that is able to take in injected values. Because from code side, you will need to set it up that way that you could, uh, your data model or whatever could chew up or your view model, those injected values that you would like to display pretty on the screen. And then you can use the same approach that like uh, Snapshot uses, let's say with launch arguments uh, to set up before launching the app. So what you can do in your UI tests before launching the app, uh, you pass any specific uh, launch argument flag that you want. Let's say uh, logged in user or whatever, you pass that flag and in your code, uh, probably under the debug flag, uh, you can access the command line arguments or it's also written user defaults. That's where you can find it. And on that flag, you can choose to inject your mock data 
And in that case, uh, you can also programmatically navigate and display the screen that you actually need. So that would uh, save you a lot of time that would be used in UI test navigation to get to one place or the other. It would allow you to like really uh, nicely fill out the screens the way you want them to look like and save you some precious time. Some uh, good practices for the ending. So I mentioned this before, uh, but this is like uh, something I've encountered when I started because uh, uh, our app already, our project already had implemented like UI tests. And of course, when I started implementing the screenshot automation, I was like, of course, I'm going to reuse this. Like this is going to be way easier. But when you're implementing UI tests, you're doing that to verify code. And the purpose is completely different from when you want to have nice screenshots. So for screenshot generation, you want to save time, make them pretty. That's pretty much it. For like UI verification, you want to go through each and every step that you want to go through. And if they're combined and hooked and dependent on each other, if one fails, the other will fail too. So I would personally suggest to have them separated if you have both. Uh, then again, uh, likely you want to have the snap the screenshot automation uh, automated to run maybe on every release. And depending on how often do you make releases and how big your changes are, uh, it might be more difficult or more easy to maintain the actual snapshot tests. So let's say if you make a release every week, likely you don't have that many changes. So if some type, uh, like if the snapshot does get like uh, outdated, it's going to be just like a small change. But if you're making a release every three months, likely you, you'll want to also automate uh, just a job to test that your tests run successfully. So when you do need the, uh, the screenshots, they get generated without issues. Another obvious thing that's also used in UI tests is disabling the animation. And of course, if you see that something's going wrong in the simulator, that your screenshots don't look as you expect, always remember that you have all the parameters to erase the simulator data, clear all the data, and run it freshly. And that's pretty much it. So I think a lot of us were probably at least one so in our life have encountered this situation. Of course, the other part of this meme is like that the automation itself takes like hours or days. Uh, but yeah, I really encourage, if not for the screenshot automation, just always try to look at your day, see if you're doing any repetitive tasks and give a shot at automating it because it's kind of fun, you know. Thank you all. Thank you.